Hi, we're going to go very quickly here into our next and last um, panel called Transforming Histories. My name is Jane Debevoise, and I am the chair of Asia Art Archive, um, both here in New York, Asia Art Archive in America, and Asian Archive in Hong Kong. We're sisters. Um, I think we're almost even clones, um, except for the fact that Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong is much bigger, has many more resources, staffing, et cetera, and I really welcome all of you to come um, there. Um, if you're coming through. Um, because I'm going to be the last person, I'm going to speak quickly, because uh, I do want to take this opportunity to thank MoMA very much, MoMA CMAP and MoMA in general very much for collaborating on this, uh, on this program. Jay Levinson and Yu Jie Lee have been uh, instrumental in getting it going, and of course there's myriad people at uh, uh, MoMA behind the scenes who are making this uh, work so well. Um, also, obviously, the AA team has been working all summer, actually, from all points of the uh, map, including China, Guangzhou, Taiwan, all sorts of Hong Kong, um, to get this done. Um, Xiaofei uh, Mo, Ali Wong, Judy Tsai, and Bernie Tam, who's done most of the translation and editing on a lot of that. She's based in Singapore and is not able to be here. Anna Dachi and the Collaborative Cataloging uh, Japan project, in some ways, sort of was an instigation for some of these thing uh, for some of this program and obviously have the contacts in, in Japan and brought our Japanese colleagues here. And of course, all the speakers today who participated in this event, many of you have come all the way from Asia and it is now, I don't know, what is it, uh, 12 o'clock um, at night for you. Um, thank you very much for staying awake and thank you very much for coming, uh, coming all this way. Um, archives. Scholars and theoreticians have written actually very, very widely on the subject of archives. Um, archives as collections, or as Sen would say, swarms of, of primary materials, original materials, um, probably because these scholars um, depend on them. They're often the basis of path-breaking research and original discovery. Some scholars have referred to the archive as an archaeological site of the future. Others have called archives material evidence, the stuff of history. Still others have characterized them as full of potentiality, the stream of possible narratives. At Asia Art Archive, we think of archive as method, as a verb, in fact, rather than a static collection or ancient swamp of material, moving material, moving image, time-based material, or otherwise. For us, archives may bear witness, but they also explore. They may validate, but they also explode. Yes, archives respond to the anxiety of obsolescence, to fear and fragility, as Sen has reminded us, but they also are, in my mind, wildly optimistic, fictional and fragmented, yet living and ubiquitous. Net-net archives can be powerful things, even though their potentiality can, like buried landmines, or in Sen's case, the upright tree trunks buried in ancient swamps, lie dormant for years, for decades, for centuries, and I guess even for uh, millennium. So this is why we encourage the activation of our archives, of our archives and other archives by artists, scholars, critics, cur curators, and that is why I'm delighted to welcome today the three people um, who are going to speak next, Miriam Ghani, Go Hirasawa, and Hongjen, Huang Jen Hong, um, who use archives to offer fresh perspectives and new ways of thinking in order to expand our understanding of history and the present. So Miriam, you're first up, and thank you very much for coming. So I obviously didn't know we'd be staring at this image all day long, or I wouldn't have used it in my presentation as well. Um, but uh, forgive me for that. OK, so uh, I'm going to actually explain it to you now. So that's a bonus. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about what we left unfinished, which is my research into the cinematic archives of Afghanistan's national imaginaries and the ways in which the shifting self-definitions of the Afghan state have been both anticipated and reflected by the visions of its artists. Oh, here we go. Okay. 
So what we left unfinished is a feature film about five unfinished feature films from the communist period in Afghanistan, and that's 1978 to 1992. And it's also a series of exhibitions, screenings, and discussions that experiment with different ways to revive the unfinished projects of the past in the present. The first exhibition in this series was called Salani Gidbad, which means Salon of the Whirlwind. And that was a week-long project that I organized at Secession in Vienna within the framework of a collectively curated show called Utopian Pulse, Flares in the Dark Room. And my Salani Gidbad was named for an earlier Salani Gidbad, which was a series of literary meetings in Kandahar in the mid 20th century, which birthed the political movement Wehezanyan, or Awakened Youth. In the Girdbad meetings, art became politics, and in that space created for and by literature, art, and culture, a new politics was imagined for Afghanistan. Awakened Youth was dissolved in a 1952 crackdown, but its influence still reverberates today. There's actually a new political party in Afghanistan also called Awakened Youth, and it was critical to the radicalization of the future leaders of the Afghan left. And yes, there was and is such a thing as an Afghan left. So uh, this is a progressive movement that actually formally became a communist party in 1965. And then it splintered into several parts, uh, before and especially after the violence of the Afghan communist coup d'etat in 1978 and the events that rapidly followed it. So we had land reforms that sparked rural resistance, purges and assassinations that led to the Soviet invasion and puppet regime. Uh, we had long years of bitter fighting around the regime-controlled cities, the withdrawal of the Soviet army in aid, we had a five-year attempt at national reconciliation between the regime and the Mujahideen, the handover of power to a Mujahideen coalition, a lot of infighting in that coalition, which then finally dissolved everything into a civil war. So the Girdbad, or whirlwind, is also an apt description for that moment in a radical movement when actual power is seized, and everything imagined seems possible briefly, until events acquire their own momentum and spin dizzily from minor mistakes into major disasters. So one of the things I'm asking in this project is, can we locate that moment, the moment before the dream disintegrated? Can we somehow recuperate its potential? Can we actually recross the shadow that fell between the intention and the act? If the original intentions, the raw desires, fears, ambitions, and ghosts of the Afghan communists are to be found anywhere, it's in their unfinished projects. The sometimes contradictory political projects of revolution, reform, and especially these days, reconciliation, and their encoded representations in unfinished artistic projects, particularly state-produced and state-canceled films. So those are basically like failed propaganda. So for the last three years, I've been looking for these five unfinished feature films. And I've also been looking for all the people who made the films, the filmmakers, actors, and crew, and collecting their stories from behind the scenes. Oh, go back one. These fragmented fictions refract the shifting moods and everyday realities of life under the regime. So 1978's triumphalist In the Month of Sar reenacts the coup d'etat with the participation of the actual army and party leaders, that's uh, Hafizullah Amin. Um, and it's a fiction that actually becomes the default document of the coup because there's no document of the coup because it was totally unplanned. Um, 1984's Al Masesia, or the Black Diamond, stages a fictional victory for regime police over the traffickers who were supporting the resistance at the time. The paranoid 1986 surveillance fable Sukut, or Falling, encodes anxieties about the uh, omnipresent intelligence service in a story about cops and robbers watching each other. 1990's Kajra, or Wrong Way, which is set partly in a Mujahideen camp, imagines a fictional reconciliation between a family split by war about a year before actual ones started taking place. And 1992's Gomashta, or Delegated, switches over entirely to the Mujahideen perspective, uh, which makes sense because it was financed by the famed commander Masood, who was apparently an enormous film buff. If you went to his camp, he had like a whole wall of VHS tapes. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you a teaser now. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oye, ya encontré mi señor escuchar que llegaba a mi otro lugar de acá. La señora me cayó. Y el mágico de los ángeles ya me dio a los pasos. Y la madre de Cuba, Joaquín Rulo también. Le llamaba para la madre de Cuba, no sé qué, como que está diciendo eso. En cualquier caso, se me ha ido a la voz, se puso más culo. Y yo, en el pasado, no me acuerdo. 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 Então, eu pensei que eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. Eu não estava aqui, mas eu não estava aqui. That's what happens when you use real blood. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's not actually even the craziest story he told me, um, and I can tell you some of those later. But uh, the process of this project, which involves reconstructing a narrative from partial rush prints, guessing at lost dialogue, gathering together images and people that have been scattered by war, mirrors the larger process through which the history of this period is gradually and gingerly being reclaimed. But there's also a really fascinating gap between the stories that were produced for the screen during the communist period and the stories of how the films were made, which, as you just heard, often involved incredible difficulties, dangers, and even deaths. Um, and this reproduces in miniature the gap between what was wished and what was done between national imaginary and lived reality at the time. So perhaps the filmmakers were trying to will the better world that they scripted into existence. And perhaps there comes a point in every revolution where it only exists in its representations. But does that mean it no longer exists? Or has it just gone into storage, waiting in the archive until its revival is required? Afghan filmmakers won't admit this unless pressed, but in the 70s and 80s, their work really became intertwined with the image and image making of the Afghan Communist Party. And the party's political projects, of re revolution, reform, and reconciliation were threaded through both propaganda and fiction films. So as these films came to represent the dreaming self of the state, the filmmakers became targets, actually legitimate targets in some ways, for attacks against the regime. And filmmaking itself became a dangerous enterprise. That's where the really crazy stories come in. Um, in the imaginary presented by most finished films of the period, we see the ideal people's democratic republic that could have been, but definitely wasn't. And only a few, like the addiction parable Ashes or the refugee family story Escape, admit any trace of the truth situation into the fictional world. In the unfinished films, the reality, a utopian project secured by violent force, lingers like a shadow, just barely concealed behind allegories and codes. The world around the films seeps into the world on screen. In finished films, it's more difficult to tease out document from fiction and coded histories from contextual clues, what was from what could have been. Unfinished films are more raw, of course, but they also come with a sort of key, the stories of why they were abandoned or canceled. One, because the leader who commissioned it was assassinated. Another, because the filmmaker fled into exile. The third, because its coded critique of state surveillance was a little too easy to read. A fourth, because the entire regime collapsed, and you know, there you have a capsule history of the whole communist period. So what we left unfinished will ultimately be a feature-length doc fiction film that brings together the stories told on screen with the stories from behind the scenes in order to reconstruct both some of the truth and some of the most important fictions of Afghan communism, and also to think about the role played by artists in political movements and by filmmaking and state myth-making. I'm hoping to finish the feature film by the end of 2017. 
But it developed from and remains continuous with my long-term engagement with Afghan films as archive, institution, and community. So this has included a long collaboration with the Mumbai-based media archive Padma, um, Public Access Digital Media Archive, on a proof of concept digitization workshop in 2012 at the archive, um, and ongoing annotation and transcription of the digitized films in Padma's online database. And we can talk a lot more about this in the afternoon, about like Padma's really rich interface for annotation, which also has timeline uh, tagging and uh, annotation and linking to specific time codes and all kinds of really kind of incredible ways for working with video uh, in an open source browser-based interface. Um, I've also done a lot of ongoing consulting with Afghan films, helping them recatalog their archive and uh, think about licensing fees and like screening fee schedules and all these different ways to do outreach. And I've done a lot of work on trying to raise awareness of the films in the archive through critical writing and curating various screening programs. Um, so, you know, my work with the unfinished films also includes critical writing, fun sidebars like designing posters, um, and uh, long-term collaborations with the original filmmakers, with the archive, and with other partners like Secession, One After 320 in Delhi, and Garage in Moscow to organize exhibitions, screenings, and conversations around the original films. And ideally, what I'd actually like to do is help the original filmmakers to finish their own films in their own ways at the same time that I make my film about them. And already what I'm doing is using the films to start conversations about what it might mean to finish these unfinished projects, both artistic and political, today with the directors who are still alive but mostly have no access to their negatives, with the larger community around filmmaking in Afghanistan, with leftist exiles outside Afghanistan, as in this project, um, and with artists, musicians, writers, and filmmakers who have never before encountered Afghan films, perhaps, but who see in these unfinished projects an opening where they might enter to imagine together. Um, at Secession, for example, the silent rush prints screened with running commentary from leftist exiles from the UK one day and with scores improvised by local musicians the next. And the, the music you heard on that teaser, by the way, was actually from this improv session in Vienna. So as anyone who has worked with this sort of archive knows, every apparent document is attended by at least three different narratives of its origin and significance, which often conflict and contradict. And you know, even though I've been visiting Afghan films for half a decade now, I still can't tell you what year the Taliban bonfire of film prints in the courtyard took place, because I've heard so many different answers to that question. But I've stepped on fragments of those burned reels accidentally while crossing from building to building. I can reconstruct from what remains. I can speculate to fill the gaps between the stories people are willing to tell and those that they still hold secret. In joining Document to Fiction, I'm participating in a long history within Afghan cinema, dating back to the very first feature produced by Afghan films. So the clip you're watching right now is a perfect example of those blurred lines between fact and fiction, past and present. And it's a dissolve between the reconstructed presidential palace of today and the reenactment of its destruction in the coup d'etat of 1978. In that uh, film I talked about earlier in the month of Sar. Uh, where the actual army performed this, uh, this reconstruction in Latif Ahmadi's film. And it, this fiction was actually used as stock documentary footage of the coup d'etat enough times that even its own director now refers to it as a documentary. So if you ever think about Afghanistan, you probably imagine this, which is a scene where our history is torn down brick by brick. But just like any other country, we have our points of eternal return, the buildings we rebuild even though we suspect they may end up destroyed all over again. And the history is always more complicated and more constructed than it may first appear. The past is still present, and the present is not yet so different from the past, and the communist period still casts a long shadow. But its importance is barely understood outside Afghanistan, and inside Afghanistan, we're just beginning to discuss it. Histories that have been off, limit for, off limits for decades are slowly resurfacing into public discourse, and it's happening through the ambiguous spaces of art, novels, short stories, and poems. Sometimes it's easier to look to fiction for truths too difficult to face when presented as facts. Sometimes the artist must be Shahrazada, seducing the nation into sanity one story at a time. In Afghanistan, what is left unfinished always returns, no matter how many times it's set aflame, and what we refuse to discuss will end by reliving. 
But if what we left unfinished in the past is worth finishing in the present, we may still preserve some things from the flames. Thank you. <laughs> While Go is um, setting up here, I just wanted to remind everybody that we haven't been given a, giving any lengthy introductions to the people because, again, I just wanted to point you to the handout that we have, all the bibliographies or all the uh, biographical information or some biographical information is there. So Go, we're delighted to have you here and thank you very much. Appreciate it. I think, thank you, but um, I, don't, I think I don't need that. And, and so thank you for coming. And so first of all, I would like to thank um, Collaborative Cataloging Japan, AAA, and MoMA. And today, so I would like to talk about circulation between research, curation, and re um, restoration through my practical example uh, of Japanese film in 1960s and 70s. Um, especially so Masawa Dachi and Motoharu Jonuchi. Adachi and um, Jonuchi are most important avant-garde and underground filmmaker in Japan. Adachi joined in Nihon University Film Club in 1959 and started to shoot avant-garde film. Then collaborated and so with Koji Wakamatsu and Nagisa Oshima. In the mid-1970s, mid he moved to Lebanon for joining in Palestinian Revolution. In 2000, he was forced to come back to Japan and at that time, so I coordinated so his retrospective and um, publication. And three years later, 2003, so I published a book, so interview with him. And, and so Jonochi uh, found Nihon University Film Club and Ban Film Science Research Center. He continued to shoot student struggle from 1960 to 1970 over uh, 10 years on his specific materialized method. Uh, their work uh, drawn attention in um, outside Japan in recent 10 years. I would like to uh, introduce some program. Uh, 2001, so I coordinated, and so I had an so underground um, archives as 1958 and 17 and 6 and so collaborate with the Fukuoka City uh, Library and Film Department. Uh, so now um, Fukuoka uh, became as a member of FIAF and so at that time so they suggested to have uh, so experimental and underground and uh, program um, and to archive and restore and preserve and so in the future. In 2003, so um, um, I helped to organize uh, so ATG retrospective. So ATG is so Japanese independent film distribution company, and 19 and they built up so in 1961 and 1968. So he started to uh, make his own and uh, their own film. And at that time, it's a very huge and so um, program um, Japanese independent and so program and, and retrospective in Vienna, and then. And so when I coordinate um, these kind of retrospectives, I, I also have international workshop like that symposium or lecture at the same time, and if possible, publication. Also, so if I need to preserve and digitize the material, actually circumstance of Japanese avant-garde underground film is a critical phase, as many negative are lost and print condition is not good. I try to make new material for showing and um, protecting film itself. Having retrospective is good to widely spread Japanese directors and the film itself around the world, but it's a short term and just, of course, also just one local space. A symposium and workshop uh, to be able to clarify historical context and background, even if it's a bit and specific to academic. And the publication, also publication is useful to make a basis uh, of accessing Japanese film history and theory for not only an audience of event. I think so, 
we have to have much strata approach for researching avant-garde, underground, and independent film because they are filmmakers and producer crossed over all of art genre and any established idea and politics. If we, a uh, researcher, um, a curator, and, and scholar, and critic, whoever, uh, introduce them and their works, and uh, we ourselves should create new interdisciplinary, a uh, new intermedia method, and union of theory and practice. And so it is, and so uh, we, had a tour Vienna, Kelly, Berlin, and so with some underground film and so Frankfurt Film Museum, and and Chongju and in and Korea and um, conference and, and at uh, University of Chicago, and and so I introduced and so Motoharu Jonuchi film in New York here, and, and now so tonic was punished and, and, and the New York University and the tonic. And in Japan, so Meiji Gakuin University, so International Symposium on Publication in Japanese, Koji Wakamatsu. And the underground um, cinema movement, Anthology Film Archive, New York University, Yale, and York, and, and so program and um, International Symposium. And 2010, and the Cinematheque Francaise, and Koji Wakamatsu, huge, uh, 40, over 40. Uh, title um, retrospective and, and and I coordinate to publish his book and it's a Japanese book and then so and at the same time so um, uh, so night night avant-garde program so and and to have so Masao Adachi retrospective and so and then so yeah usual you um, um, yeah, anyway so um, afternoon and Koji Wakamatsu and night so Masao Adachi program and so how about the film archive, Toshio Matsumoto. Toshio Matsumoto is the most uh, important, historically important, and so Japanese and so document, avant-garde documentarist. And ATG, New Tour, and France, and the British Film Institute, and at the same time, and Berkbeck, and so, and the symposium, international symposium, and underground screening, and the theater, Scorpio Close Up Film Center, and then, um, Yeah. And uh, so in Montreal, uh, Cinema Dave Quebec was ATG and the Japanese Independent Retrospective. Uh, at the same time, so McGill University, so an um, international symposium and retrospective, so called, and so visual underground. And then 2012, and so MoMA at Shutter Guild and the Japanese Underground Cinema 1960s, 1980s, over um, 40 program. At the, at the same time, so Tokyo exhibition and happened. And so ATG tour, so I, I, I coordinated an US tour and MoMA and, and so University of Berkeley, so Pacific Film Archive at so conference at um, Berkeley. And the underground program, Yerba Buena Center in San Francisco, fragment of Japanese underground. And then Pacific, so ATG. And move back and move back to New York Anthology Film Archive, so ritual in avant-garde film experiment, uh, focus on more radical documentary and more political and experimental film. And how about the film archive, so Masawa, the retrospective. And so in recent years, so I, I slightly switched to emphasis on theoretical and more practical approach for preservation because their work and this kind of Japanese and underground and independent work have already been shown in many places like that. Adachi and uh, so Masao Matsuda, film critic and anarchist, provide, uh, provoked landscape theory, theory of landscape, uh, theory of landscape, uh, through AKA Serial Killer 1969. I try to elucidate the film and landscape theory in terms of not only Japanese film uh, history, Japanese film theory, but also universal film and political theory. Landscape theory provided the conceptual context for a new theory of anti-spectacular based on experimental cinematic practice that considered film a perspective, formal, analytical, and tactical medium. And this and so this book, the French, uh, French book, and so essay. So I edited essay um, and by so Basawadachi 
and then so conference so landscape con um, conference about landscape theory and so NYU and UCLA and Goldsmith. And I like I would like to show AKA serial killer. So AKA serial killer was co-produced by Adachi Matsuda and then um, and they have been active in radical politics during the 1960s, yet uh, neutral the problematic concern about the situation confronted by the struggle. The decline of mass movement after 1969 and the rise of ultra militancy. Uh, in AKA, the camera eye simply and for, um, simply follows a series of landscapes that an underclass, underclass, underclass worker Norio Nagayama, who killed four people by a stolen gun. There is also Shinjuku Station, so East Gate, before a riot. And next, so I would like to introduce uh, so Motoharu Jonochi's famous so Gebald Pier trailer. Uh, Jonochi Motoharu's uh, Motoharu Jonochi's Gebald Pier series, such as Gebald Pier trailer, 1969. Attempt to capture the violent political struggle of the period that are representative of 1968. Sorry. And so his technique of layering scene of empty streets, campus, and many activity uh, activists before event, before riot, avoid making political protest into a spectacle and instead uh, attempt to materialize the outer formation of this space. So these new digital material are made in 19, um, 2011 and 12 for ATG and Underground so World Tour. And um, recently, so I'm involved in the so Asian Experimental Film Archive by Asian Cultural Center in Guangzhou. Uh, it's a new institution. They support to make new into negative and digital material, especially for Adachi and Jonochi. And um, actually, so Adachi um, moved to so, um, Lebanon in the 1970s, some negative vanished, and Jonochi, and um, all of all, most of the title and uh, negative was, were vanished. And so if we need new prints, uh, so we, had, we have to make into negative. And I think so. I think so. It will be difficult more and more to make a print and a negative in Japan. Of course, I suppose I imagine so in East Asian and Asian country too. And so, so we should try to secure the access to Japanese avant-garde and underground films through uh, international net networks, so not only uh, Japanese uh, cultural institution, museum, university. I think so. It's it's. It's good to discuss to start to discuss and so uh, museum around the world and the university and so um, U.S. and European and Asian countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyo. Um, last speaker for today, and thank you all for uh, staying around, is uh, Huang uh, Jianhong. Jian Hong. 
um, who has come from in from Taiwan, and uh, we look forward to hearing. And then we're going to have a short Q&A. And one of the things I think we want to do is open it up very quickly to uh, questions from the audience, um, because we want to hear what you want to have to say. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Um, And it's my great pleasure to share with you uh, today two Taiwanese uh, uh, artists archiving projects with the visual material under the idea of archiving, uh, of the um, migrating archive. The title uh, Migrating Archives refers to the original historical and the political context of uh, the archival material. The artists or researchers individual archiving projects maintain critical meaning and uh, the stories told in an artist's archive always uh, undergo a kind of migration. For example, an artist's project could bring together various archival materials that wouldn't have coexisted in their original time and space. I believe it's not an experience limited to such art project in Taiwan, but something that can be found anywhere. And firstly, I want to quote one idea from Didi Beiman during a discussion at OCT Research Institute of uh, Beijing in June 2015. He explained the differences between archive and the atlas, and he emphasized the importance of mentage as a method to build the atlas. His idea of mentage implies two essential points for the archival work. One is the importance of individual experiences. The other is that the relationship of archive and atlas is so dynamic that we cannot ignore their difference or simply separate them as two categories. With this collection of mentage and atlas, we could say archiving constitutes the migration of ideas and images which we could see in the works of Chris Marker, Jean-Louis Godard, or Harren Faraki. For example, uh, in the Histoire du Cinéma, the, hi the histories of cinema by Jean-Louis Godard, he tried to mix the still image soundtracks of uh, movies or of uh, documentary, and even with the uh, image of painting, also mix the narrative uh, of uh, fiction and the uh, historical fact to form a uh, 20th century history. And uh, based on this idea, um, as the image you could see, the uh, photography by Yao Ruizhong and uh, LOSD group. And uh, this is the project, uh, the title is Mirage Project. And uh, they did a huge investigation about the abandoned public buildings, original designs as cultural centers and uh, exhibition spaces in Taiwan. But finally, we call these buildings uh, as uh, pavilions of mosquitoes, meaning that they are useless and became residency of mosquitoes. He and the LOSD group employed the photography and uh, documentary to document these buildings, which were built through the governmental funding under the purpose of the cultural development. But most of them were abandoned after the construction or opening because there's no program for these spaces. So the existence of such abandoned spaces are known to the public, but uh, perhaps they are taken as normal and thus aren't uh, reported in the press or covered in any archives. 
this archiving project by Yao, Reizhong, and the LSD groups makes this excluded buildings visible and open up a possibility of discussion. And then, the second case study is uh, Liu Jixiong's uh, exceptional topos project. And uh, as you see this picture, that's uh, a picture uh, of 1986 on the beach of uh, uh, Ha Anbo in South Korea, and uh, where the, the small ship of 19, 19 Chinese young persons uh, uh, were floating uh, until here, and uh, there there was a uh, um, U.S. Navy base there. So uh, they are arrested uh, by the South Korea Army. And uh, this is a documentary project based on his personal research about uh, the anti-communist heroes uh, during the Cold War. There were many uh, political refugees from the mainland to Taiwan during Cold War. And uh, many were interpreted as anti-communist heroes under the political propaganda in Taiwan, but uh, treated as spies behind the media. Even some of them were arrested, tortured, and uh, put in the jail for more than 10 years. In one case, the hero became a kidnapper and uh, executed after kidnapped the son of the rich, richest person at a later time. By following this investigation of the network of those refugees, Liu had uh, to travel to China, South Korea, and uh, Vietnam to understand how these lives under the international political dispositive developed and migrated, and how the official history and the archive determine their lives without a deep understanding. His archiving work constitutes the process that includes certain excluded lives and shows the complication of the networking of uh, migrating lives beyond the conflict of nation states. Each of Liu's documentation is a research journey which makes his uh, films as a process of uh, archiving the excluded people, the society, and the related uh, event. Thinking about the investigation of uh, individual lives by the artists, uh, we could say it seems that lesson in Asia generated from the networking of migrations, not with the networking of countries. For Liu, the migration is not exceptional, but uh, the quotidian in Asia. So with Yao and Liu's archiving project, we could see how the artist's sensibility and intention realize the subtle atlas that tries always to understand a life of inevitable migration. Therefore, to form a kind of resistance to biopolitics now, it's significant that an individual or non-institutional archiving act to complete the atlas as a resistance of being excluded. The presentation and the existence of the minority is always lost from the alteration of the majority because contemporary art as a profession includes minority or state itself as a minority or even like the religious reinterpretation on the minority asylum. Yeah. Um, wait, um, lesser, lesser words, yeah. 
While some continuous debate on leading historiography and try to dissolve monotony, the other on discover the chaotic ocean or like a swamp <laughs> of uh, under archived documents become the realization of the inclusion of the excluded, just uh, as the roses rise them. Thank you very much. interesting projects with it. No, I've got a very loud voice, I've been told. <laughs> so it rarely needs amplification. Anyway, um, what I think might be great is if people in the audience have any questions, um, just raise them now. As I said, we have three minutes. So please, um, this, is, this is your opportunity to talk to uh, the panelists. And if there's no questions, which I can't believe, um, I will <laughs> ask a question. Um, What's very interesting about your, all of your work, and this could be a question perhaps for all three of you, is you've, relied, you've relied, relied on archives. But in many respects, some of these archives are crumbling, hard to ex access, um, and have their own issues and complications around them. Could you just speak a little bit about the process of even knowing these material existed? Um, and then um, the process of, of, of of extracting it, of, of, of getting the opportunity to work with it, and whether they understand your agenda, mm. if there is such a thing, shall I be so bold? <laughs> well, I've talked about the process of working with the Afghan Films Archive as a, it's like a sort of dance, three steps forward, two steps back. Um, I've also talked about the process of working with an archive as um, it can't ever be purely extractive. You always have to give something to get something. Um, that's what I believe anyway. Um, and I always, with the Afghan Films Archive, the thing I tried to do first was understand what they desired um, before I tried to go in with what I might want from them. So first I tried to understand what they might want from me. Um, and then I started thinking about what I might want from them. Um, and I think that was the right approach. Um, it certainly made them like me more <laughs> and be more willing to, to reveal things to me. So it's been a, a long, like, five-year relationship building up um, an understanding of what was there. And with the unfinished films, I first heard about them as a rumor. There might be some unfinished films in this archive. Um, and then it took me actually several years to figure out how many there were. First I was told 15, then 10, then I narrowed it down to five, and what years they were from. And then to actually find the physical films is actually still an ongoing process. Um, I found prints, but not the rush prints, but not the negative. So it's a, it's a, it's a long uh, process always to, to do that kind of work. And uh, at first, so, and I, would, I would like to research this kind of avant-garde and uh, experimental film. But um, if I want to see, so I have to find material, and I have to digitalize. And so, um, and so like that. And, but um, so it's, it's not easy to um, find the material and digitalize and make new prints. And uh, in Japan, so uh, National Film Center, and the uh, so Fukuoka Citizen Museum, the so Kawasaki City Museum, so uh, involved in these kind of, but, uh, but experimental and underground film, it's totally difficult um, um, to be preserved. And so, and so recent 10 years, so um, I'm working as an um, uh, institution and the cinematic around the world. And so next step, I think, and so collaborate with them and then to preserve and to restore and um, I 
think so it's yeah it's a next step for me um and i um <coughs> Um, since uh, since 1945 until until now, there there are five times um, the the state the government destroy the national document. There there are um, five times, and uh, more recently, it's just uh, this year, they destroy uh, more than thousand um, documents of the archive center. On what so, basis did they destroy? Why? Um, no reason. It, it's uh, some document um, concerning the politic. Yeah. So um, we we could know like Leo. Uh, we we need uh, a long time to refine the, the document from the people. Mm. We we can we we never uh, could find the complete uh, document in the archive center. I mean, I think also there's, um, as David said earlier, every um, the the process of description and cataloging uh, is, and the way that you access materials in an archive is so much through the filter of whoever has been doing that cataloging and that description, and um, making the decisions about what's accessible. So, so much of the process of working with an archive is about working with the archivists. Um, and building a relationship with those people and understanding what their relationship is with the material. And um, I think that's been such an important part of my work with the Aachen Films Archive, where it's now at the point where when I arrive and I turn up, they just sort of pass me a DV tape and they're like, we think you would really love this. Um, and then I take it home and I look at it and I'm like, oh my God. God, these are like Chinese worker ballets. Why do you have this? And how did you know I would love this? Like, so, but you know, that's five years later. So it, it took some time to get to the point where we all knew each other that well. Um, I think we're, we're time's up. I've just got the signal. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for the speakers. Thank you to MoMA and Stuart. Thank you.